Bond, any thug can kill. I have to know I can trust you. Well, I understand double O's have a very short life expectancy. You are a kite dancing in a hurricane, Mr. Bond. Is this really what you want? Always alone? Welcome to Mix Presents Sound for Film and Television Awards season. We're here now to talk about James Bond in No Time to Die, uh, the year's biggest grossing theatrical release so far, uh, long delayed and every bit worth it when you go out and see it theatrical. I'm here with uh, Oliver Tardy, supervising sound editor, sound designer, all kinds of things, contributes to the mix. We have Simon Hayes, uh, production sound, which is certainly a challenge on any film that moves around as much as James Bond does. And we're here with Paul Massey, uh, well known movie recording mixer who has a number of projects we'll see this year, one of them being James Bond. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, two of you are out of the UK where this film was mixed at Goldcrest Post, Oliver and Simon. Uh, I understand the edit was at Twickenham. Uh, long history of James Bond in, uh, in London. Uh, Oliver, you've worked on these films before. When you get a script like this, uh, you have a certain obligation to the franchise, but you want to bring your own signature. I mean, what's it like working on a James Bond film? The, in terms of taking them on a series like this, it, the producers are fantastic at choosing directors who are going to bring something new to it. You know, there has to, it's a series of films, a very long-running series of films. There has to be certain things where there's continuity, um, but they've always um, allowed, you know, they pick directors who are going to bring something to it, something fresh. And I think Kerry certainly did. Um, you know, even the opening scene, that was that was a great, uh, that was the very first thing um, we received. And it just, it felt very, very different for a, a Bond film. You know, you have the misdirection straight away. You think that's Bond walking through the snow. It's not. Um, you, you think he's going to shoot the girl at the, you know, the ice and um, he doesn't. Uh, so there's a few things there instantly with a twist on it. But also we got, you know, very specific sound notes. We were, we became aware that Kerry wanted uh, a lot of attention to small details like the crampons and the very slow um, sliding of the door, you know, almost really wanted it to be like a, a horror film, that sort of creepy kind of psychological horror film as opposed to um, a big action film. So it felt very, very, you know, so the very first scene that we had, it was very obvious he was going to bring us something that was different. And I love that opening scene. I mean, it's, uh, it's largely from a sad uh, person's point is largely silent, really. I mean, it's almost a predator stalking prey in the snow coming into a house. There's fear. And we're so used to, there'll be car chases after that for a Bob movie, but these quiet, the quiet scenes demand their own art, right? I mean, it's not, yeah. it's not always mixing a big action scene. A quiet scene can be challenging. Can you talk about the challenges? Oliver, Paul, I mean, whoever wants to step in, that opening scene is brilliant with the little girl. Yeah, I was just, as I mentioned, the, the detail, the little details like the crampons and things and just, you know, the metering of the way he's walking is very, very deliberate. And also just as a the overall th thing, it's set up all the people who work for Safin. If you look at the way his team then go into the British bio lab, you know, and they laser cut the glass and the glass just falls really slowly with that lovely womp rather than this big smash, you know, explosion thing that you would expect normally. It's a very different thing. And that's the people working for him. And so you have even from the sort of Team Safin to Team Blofeld, there's a very different approach to the to those groups of people. And so I think it was really nice to set up that he had this very deliberate manner and the people that work for him would be very concise, very deliberate. Um, and so, yeah, I think instantly you're kind of getting his personality and of the team that um, are working with him. And that's, that's established in the opening scenes, certainly, that there's going to be bigness to come. Paul, um, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, Gary Weinstrom once told me that a, a scene of a kid sitting on glass that's about to break can't be more challenging to mix than a huge action battle in some ways, because you're naked there. And that's certainly a pivotal scene right in the first five minutes. Can you talk to me about that? standing on ice that's about to crack when you don't get much sound yeah i mean i, I agree totally with gary on that that um, some of the quieter scenes are obviously much more difficult to direct the uh, the audience as to where the attention should be focused and um, oliver and his crew did a great job with um with the ice cracking sounds and the fact that um you know she's in she's not only in danger from being chased and and killed with this 
a maniac with a gun, but she's also in, in danger of falling into the ice cold water and, and drowning. And then you think, you know, you think Rami's character is going to kill her with the gun. And then you find out that later that she's um, actually been saved by him shooting into the ice and opening it up. Um, I think the ice cracking there was probably the the sort of glass moment that Gary would, would have been referring to in his film. And um, yeah, certainly some of the quieter scenes allow the dynamics with the uh, with the big action sequences that you know are going to come up um, to to give you different colors and and give you little respites through the film, so that it doesn't become overwhelming all the way through. One of the other areas I think that that Oliver and and Mark Taylor, who mixed effects, uh, did so very well was the in the Donut Square when um, when they they're sitting inside the the Aston Martin and and they're being shot at. And you hear the in the glass all the way around you in, in Atmos. You hear it, the thump and the breaking of the glass, the shattering of the, sh the, the little pieces that are coming off. Um, that was brilliantly done. And, and for, the, for the emotion of the scene, but also for the tension that it, that it builds, as you know, you know the glass is, is not going to make it all the way. Uh, it's not going to take many more shots before that gets broken. Um, so go ahead. And he, he remains so calm throughout it that it's, it's sort of a pivotal moment and you have this shift in perspective. I've decided, I mean, something like that. We're going to talk about the locations you have to deal with, but something like that where you're, you have a lot of interiors going into exteriors, back to interiors in Bond movies. Uh, what's that like from a production mixer's point of view? Oh, you know, it's just so exciting because the thing about the Bond movie is it's, it's not just a simple action movie. It's a story and No Time to Die was a very emotional story. And so I'm trying to deliver all of the action effects that are going to help Oliver and Paul build that suspense. But I'm also trying to deliver perfect production dialogue. Um, you know, Carey's, Carey's uh, uh, MO from the very get-go was that he didn't want to ADR anything and he wanted to really protect the original performances because he knew that there was so much emotion in this love story between Madeline and 007 that he, you know, he knew that he was going to find it difficult to, to recreate that in an ADR studio six months later. And so as well as trying to deliver all of the components to help Oliver build the effects, I was also really protecting those original performances. But let's just rewind back to that first scene as that, that's what the other guys are talking about because I, I've got a, a great story about that. Um, you know, when, when we, that was the first day of the shoot, we did Rami walking through that deep snow and as he gets closer and closer to the frozen lake, the snow is getting sparser and sparser and he's actually starting to step onto ice. And uh, we did a first rehearsal and Carrie said to me, look, I, re I want this scene. There's no dialogue in it. I want to really build suspense here. You know, what can we do about that? And I said, look, this crampon noise is, is incredible. And he said, well, can, can you get that? Because we're, we're shooting multi-camera and we've got IMAXs, which are, which are loud. And I said, yeah, I know exactly what we're going to do. So we went over to Rami and said, look, Rami, we want to mic you up. And Rami was like, but guys, I don't, I don't have any dialogue. I, I don't need to wear a mic. And I was like, no, Rami, look, what we're going to do is we're going to put one mic on your left foot and we're going to put another mic on your right foot so that when you travel through this very, very deep snow and you start getting closer to the frozen lake and then your crampons start gripping on that ice, it's going to create this real ominous journey and transition onto the ice. And Rami, the moment I said that, his face lit up and he was like, okay, I get it. I know what you guys are doing now the mics on and from that moment we kind of we had a friend for life with Rami because he realized that as well as trying to deliver that fantastic original performance from his dialogue we were also really trying to build up suspense with sound effects that I could pass back to Oliver because of course lots of sound effects can be recreated later and augmented later but things like those boots traveling through different depths of snow and then onto the ice incredibly time consuming to do afterwards so to just be able to deliver that to Oliver was was really cool one of the things I love about uh, is they go from interior to exterior very fast in Bob movies, apparently. <laughs> in and out of cars, from the sky to the water, from the club, outside the club. It moves a lot. Um, and uh, it's sort of even, it's one of the signature sounds are cars, and weapons, and things that we expect 
from James Bond. Uh, you know, there's action sequences. So all the real stuff, you, you get a script like this, two hours and 40 minutes long, you say, what can I do? What can I do and do? What, what were your thoughts? Um, well, I guess um, just of the, the nature of how um, the schedule was, uh, I think they finished filming end of October and we, we finished mixing, I think, mid-February, literally just uh, just before everything started locking down for the initial COVID uh, wave. So, you know, obviously you can't track layer, <laughs> track layer sound designer film in two and a half months. Um, we started, you know, not long after Simon, maybe like a month or two after production started. So we were getting, you know, a three-minute scene or a six-minute scene just as a self-contained scene. So I think in some ways... You know, if you were just given a, a two hour 40 film and said, you know, go at it, uh, then you would probably, you know, there's potential to panic a little bit and then just start trying to fill it up quickly. But because you're only looking at this, you know, smallest chunk of uh, film and you're just seeing it as a self-contained scene, you just went, fine, what's the very best thing for this scene alone? And then, and then get that, you know, up on its feet and working and it had its own identity. And then as we start... We're moving through the schedule, we'd get the scene that goes before it and after it. And then you obviously you need to, you know, that it's part of an arc, just of a reel, but also of the film. So then you can start tailoring and think, actually, we've gone too heavy here going into the, the scene before or after. So then we could tailor it. But I think it was actually, you know, just the way it happened that we could just work on self contained sequences uh, and, and build it up that way was actually a really helpful thing for giving each scene its own identity. So you're also, able to, I imagine getting involved that early, you're able to really understand what the director is looking for early. I mean, I yeah. imagine the feedback comes. Are these pretty polished? I mean, if you're working on it halfway through while they're still shooting, do you get it? How close do you get it? Before you yeah, we, it off the I mean, well, we had to, yeah, we were basically pre-mixing a couple of months after they finished filming. So ah, okay. at the point when they got to the, um, what would normally be the director's cut, you know, if you, normally you've got 12 weeks after you finish filming, obviously that wasn't there. Um, um, so yeah, it was really, and, and um, Tom and Elliot, the two editors um, in the on the picture side, they were fantastic at, you know, obviously they were doing the same as well. They were, as they were filming, as an editor does do, they start assembling um, and putting cuts together of sequences, they would then speak to us and say, you know, we're about to show Kerry two or three versions of this scene. Can you do something for us? Um, so we would then sound design the scene, do a dialogue cleanup on the scene. Um, we even had Mark Taylor then, because we knew we had a tight schedule, we had Mark Taylor embedded with us, not from the very beginning of when we'd started, but, you know, definitely while they were still filming. So we had an effects mix on the corridor with us. So suddenly a scene would come in, we'd have four or five of us cut through all the sound design and the dialogue would get cleaned up and then it would go to Mark and he'd spend like an hour or two hours just getting these clips done. That would then be sent by Tom and Elliot to Kerry and he would give obviously the editorial notes to Tom and Elliot, but that incorporated all the sound notes as well. So even if we didn't get FaceTime because he was filming with Kerry, we were getting constant feedback. So by the time it came to the end of filming, you know, he had something that he was familiar with and had a lot of say with the direction it had gone into. So it was a, it was a fantastic uh, workflow we had. Mm -hmm. It's um, like Wiley Statement sometimes calls it the rolling mix or something. Paul, did you get involved early? Were you involved earlier than you might normally be in a film to start hearing this? Or how did, when did you become involved? No, I wasn't. Um, I, I actually started right at the pre-dub uh, moment. Um, so unfortunately, I wasn't available for any of the, that sort of temp gathering of sounds. Um, but I, I was able to get involved with the scoring um, earlier than normal. And, and Hans and his team came onto the stage um, a fair bit while we were uh, leading up to the final mix when we were doing the pre-dubs as well. He would come in and present ideas before they were mixed by his scoring mixes. Um, and and we would f would figure out, you know, a, a template and, and how things were going to flow during the final mix. Um, bear in mind, this was all a fairly short time window. So, um, you know, he didn't have the luxury of sending something to me and then me saying, can you change it and can you do it like this? And um, in terms of layout or how instruments were split or anything like that. Um, so he was trying to accommodate early on and it was very, very helpful. It was a whole team effort there on the score. He could almost design it for flexibility in a way that if you get involved early, correct? Uh, uh, but uh, back to weapons, you sort of avoided that question earlier, Oliver. <laughs> the, the Bond weapons in Q, their signature. I mean, this is half the reason the teenage boys go to these movies. Uh, the cars, uh, there, there are a number of chases. Everything we'd expect in Bond. Uh, what, 
what what do you what's the pressure on you? Uh, what do you come up with this new? What are you proud of in the in sort of the weapons and vehicles, the Ricos, whatever? Yeah, the vehicles, you know, Paul touched on the, the donut square scene earlier where um, the DB5 was, is just getting, you know, hit by that heavy salvo. Um, and then the individual um, gun sounds from Primo hitting the glass. I mean, I think that was a, a fantastic new spin on a DB5, you know, chase in a Bond film. Um, I, you know, we already recorded a load of guns are, are there, but obviously with that many window hits, we had to uh, record a lot more bullets on glass and then also just some hammers on glass as well, just to have a different palette because it was, you know, coming from everywhere. So if it started sounding too repetitive, it got fatiguing too quickly. But um, And then the other car chase, the uh, the one in Norway, you know, we're, we're really fond of that one. It was to have a, a really high octane, heavy, you know, helicopters, motorbikes, Land Rovers flipping over, going through water, everything else, really full on car chase. And then, you know, in a, in a long film like this, you you have to have dynamics, you have to have loud, then quiet. It's too fatiguing just to stay loud. And then we, you go into the the misty woods, and it's a totally different kind of um, action scene where it's it's a much more psychological kind of thing. You don't. Again, it's a great use of Atmos, but you, you're not sure of where the vehicles are that are circling them. Um, they're sort of circling sharks was the idea, and they're just sort of coming in closer, but it's it's quite abstract which direction they're in deliberately. Um, and uh, and so it was a very different kind of scene. But, um, yeah, they gave us um, the DB5 and the DBS and the, the V8 and the Land Rovers and the motorbikes with all the stunt drivers. Uh, we had a couple of days at, um, at track. And um, so, yeah, we... Yeah, with quite a strict brief not to, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> trash the trash the DB5. <laughs> well, uh, you mentioned something about space here and with Atmos. Um, big, big conversation in the music industry right now. We're seven, eight years in in the film industry. Uh, on a film like this, um, you know, Atmos has this advantage in quiet room environments where you hear ambience. It also has this advantage in expansiveness. Simon, why don't we start with you? I mean, you must go on set thinking this is going to play back huge. Uh, do you think about Atmos when you do any of this? Or am I-, I do. What I want to do is I. What I want to do is I, I always think about what's going to happen, what I think is going to happen with the score and what I think is going to happen with the effects. And what I try and do, obviously, my primary role is to try and get the dialogue as clean as possible. But then I'll be doing other jobs. You know, Oliver and I collaborated before we even started shooting, which is a, a real testament to how seriously Eon and Michael G. Wilson and Barbara Broccoli take sound, but also mixed with with Carey, who's just a he's an audiophile. He loves sound. Um, you know, the first time I met Kerry, we were speaking about home hi-fi and, and about sound systems for like 60 minutes before we even started talking about film sound. So he's, he's really, really into sound. And, uh, and, it, and basically, Oliver and I started talking very, very early on about what I was going to do with vehicles. And obviously, a lot of the cars that we use on the set don't have the correct engine note. But wherever possible, when I could, I was giving uh, Oliver stereo effects from... Uh, from car engines and from and from car exhaust pipes and just thinking about whenever possible when it was the real engine being able to give him something that again he would augment with far far greater scope in his recordings but i always wanted to 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 deliver that choice so that that production sound that real production sound could help join in to uh, the rebuild afterwards. And so it's almost like the way that I see production sound, not just the production dialogue, but also the sync atmos, any of the sync effects, is that they almost become part of the part of the palette that uh, the, the, the eventual sound sound design can choose from. Um, and, and you know the other thing was Carey said to me, wherever we're somewhere interesting, he said, look, I don't really like to to rebuild atmosphere tracks. So Whenever we're somewhere interesting, can you go out? Can can you get a stereo mic out? And and you know he was very very uh he was very sure about what he wanted. He said I want a stereo mic. Um, I want it recorded in in M and S, which is another thing that Oliver wanted, so that we could make a decision whether that was going to play in stereo or whether Oliver just wanted to take the mono effects so that he could give it to Paul to be placed around the room. And we did that in Matera a lot with the different uh the different atmoses and the the church bells and stuff like that. And so it really just becomes part of that, part of that sort of signature sound for each location, and uh, and, and then you know that's handed over to Oliver and Paul, and they decide how much they're going to augment it or whether they're going they're going to rebuild completely. But again, it's really about choice. It's, it's interesting because what I did with uh, Wiley Statement and the Queen's Gambit, they recorded the churches with almost a deck of tree 
uh, just to get that sound of that church. I mean, is this where we're headed with Atmos, Oliver? For you, are you thinking more in terms of space as much as you are ricochets and everything? Or? Yeah, totally. Yeah, you know, ambience is a huge part of uh, um, what we do. You know, it builds up. You know, also you, it's underlying the character always. Even in the early bit in Jamaica, it looks idyllic where he's living, but you kind of all the ambience we put in there is actually slightly agitated kind of sounding because he's not relaxed in, in being retired. So everything we've done there to augment all the atmospheres there, all the ambience, all, so all the way through. And just Atmos is just lovely for that. You know, you just get airs and everything just, you know, around the room above. It just, there's that lovely sense of space. It's fantastic. Um, and obviously what Paul then can do musically. Is, oh, that's what I say with Paul with music and dialogue, that space is everything. I mean, right. I mean, that's how, that's how you get 12,000 tracks into a reel, right? You create a space for it. <laughs> It really is, but um, I, I try very, very hard to make sure that it's going to sit well in seven one and five one too, because that's going to be the primary, um, uh, the the most amount of people are going to see it in those formats. But Amos certainly gives you, I mean, the full range surrounds and the uh, and the space that you can create is truly wonderful. I tend with the score, um, with with a score like this, Hans had everything split out as I mentioned earlier, and so I'll probably go more with um. Uh, utilizing pads and choirs and things that aren't sharp transients into the uh, upper ceiling, ceiling speakers and, and around us just to create an immersive feel without you feeling like you're being distracted from what you're seeing on screen right in front of you. Um, I'm not a big fan of, of those transient items taking your attention away when it's a dialogue scene or when it's not necessary. Um, and and likewise with, with, with dialogue, I mean, Atmos also allows you to really utilize um, the full space for reverbs, and and uh, No Time to Die was was gave a lot of got a lot of opportunity for that. Certainly, when we got to you know Saffron's Island, and we got into those big the uh, the acid wash huge room and the um, and the corridors and all of the rest um, reverb could really be utilized and Carrie was a fan of it and uh, didn't object to it. Um, so and that I, helps the scene. It helps the scene move too, right? That variance in reverb as you go through, because with Tara, that, that island scene, I mean, it's a spoiler alert. It's a big closing battle. Um, you know, it's, you know, moving through multiple, you know, inside and out, each of those rooms has to have a different character. And I think being able to utilize Atmos for um, uh, different reverb situations have become more immersive in the in the in the corridors and the halls and the exteriors um, allows a subtle change of color to the audience that they may not be completely aware of, but keeps the interest up and stops um, so let's say two dialogue scenes that are both interior from becoming boring. Um, if there was um, you know any any reason why that would happen, but um, that that's it's just possible. another it's a very subtle way of being able to use Atmos. I think that um, you know the constantly changing colors throughout the film and creating an arc between dynamic scenes and quiet scenes is really important. But even Paul, you know the the Blofeld jail, you know, is, it, having that Atmos thing, where you have, you can go huge and use the whole room, and then we have that early reflection kind of boxy Blofeld, you know, uh, dialogue sound, which is fantastic. So again, it's just contrast. Like again, on a long film like this, it was just really nice to have a completely different texture. So Atmos allows you know that scale of going very big to then very tight, and and have quite a harsh character um, or you know a very tight confined character to to something. It was nice to have these shifts. It works, it works well in the living room and the warehouse, you know, it works well for both environments, nice and tight. Uh, uh, we have, we're running out of time. I think we're already past it. But uh, working on a Bob movie has got to be special. I mean, it's part of every, every, every certainly every male uh, movie going experience for the last 50 years. Uh, Oliver, what are your takeaways from this? You've worked on a couple now. I mean, what, what was challenging? What was fun? Um. Yeah, it's fun. It, it is fun. They're just they're fantastic films to work on. The the production, you know, it it's run in a way that you don't see very often um, nowadays. The producers <laughs> facilitate in the right way. You you can see they they care about the crew um, and and they they want the best for the film and and give everybody what they need to do. You know what what is best for the film. It's a fantastic thing. And just for me, it's probably my earliest cinematic. Um, 
you know, if I think back of uh, where the, the first films I went to go and see at the cinema, they were probably the ones I can remember were probably the Roger Moore ones in the 70s. So, you know, of course, it's a it's a huge uh, thing to, to work on these films. There's always that bit there, you, you know, that instantly back to being in the 70s, watching them just going, you know, as a kid. So it's yeah. Simon, Simon, did you get a? Did you take a month off? You must have been exhausted with running around with all them in and out of the cars. And stuff. <laughs> Those locations get me tired you sometimes. Know what, you know what, Tom? It, the, the the truth is, it wasn't that exhausting, and I will tell you why. Because as Oliver touched on, the way that Eon Productions run this movie, it's almost like you're making a small independent movie. And what I mean by that is the level of support. And also every head of department and all of their teams are all that it's kind of like, okay, everyone, we're on a bond. We're here to do the very, very best job that we can and also support each other. And so nothing was too much trouble. If I needed a generator moved, it would just be done. No question. If I needed, you know, if I needed the VFX department to paint a cable out of some out of Rami's neck because so we could put a, a microphone in his hairline, it would just be done. Whatever I requested, I was just given complete and utter support by my fellow crew members, by the producers, and by Kerry. And, and also, Linus, the, the DP, was just a, again another sound enthusiast. And it doesn't matter how hard a movie is, when you get that level of support, you finish fresh. Mm -hmm. Paul, you've you've mixed a few big films in your life. Um, what makes Bond special? I mean, what, what, you walk in, you, is there, like, you put on your A game, or what do you do? Well, I mean, uh, for me, I, I was also I was born in England, um, and and like Oliver mentioned, you know, we we grew up on the early Bond films, and to me, this is just the most iconic franchise of all. And um, I think the entire team joins that whether it's the first film first bond that they've ever done like me or whether it's your second or third um you put on your a game you go above and beyond and um and you work very much as a huge team effort to get the very best uh, that we can for the film for the directors for the producers but and for the film for the audiences at large um it can't have a half-hearted bond it just can't it's gonna have to be full on all the way from the bottom half-hearted it, it still would be out but it did come out bond leads the leads the you know, box office for the year bringing back uh, and thankfully back in theaters one of the first ones to get us back into the theaters which is very nice i want to thank you oliver simon and paul for joining us and, and also a nod to mark taylor on the recording side and james harrison on the supervising sound design side fantastic job gentlemen um uh, and we thank you, the audience, for joining us at Mix and One Season. Pay attention this week. The short list is voting uh, from, I believe, the 7th to the 10th. I'm going to work on that. Early December, you have a week to vote, and then nominations in January. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Tom. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks for having us, Tom.